Welcome to Utah Story Show, my friend. On the program today, we have Pete Ashdown, who owns and operates a local internet service providing company called X Mission. So Pete's a cool dude. He ran against Senator Orrin Hatch in, I believe it was 2006. Um, he ran for that incredibly difficult Senate seat that now Mitt Romney has. Um, but besides that, he's been an outspoken advocate for internet privacy. I had him. I had to have him on the show to talk about all things Facebook and Google and a little bit of Amazon. So they're basically tracking all of our private data, and Google is tracking where we are going, what we are doing. Um, Google is selling your data based on where you're going in your car, what you're looking on, looking at at YouTube, and of course what you're searching for. Um, so we talk about this concept called filter bubbles, where because Facebook and Google know so much about you, they create a filter bubble around you so that you're only exposed to the opinions, ideas, and politics that you will actually agree with. So this is further polarizing our country because you're not even going to learn about what the other side agrees with. So a lot of these ideas I picked up from reading a book by Roger McEnany called Zooked. Um, it goes into how algorithms are deliberately written to rewire our brains so that dopamine is released and we get addicted. It was They're deliberately created to do this. And when I say we get addicted, we find that children are especially susceptible. And this is leading to all sorts of adverse effects like not only addiction but online bullying, which leads to, in many cases... Um, loss of self-esteem, self-worth, and just an overall pervasive, unrealistic view of the world in many children today. So I believe this is something everybody needs to understand much better. So without further ado, my conversation with Pete Ashdown. All right, Pete Ashdown, thanks for being on the program. My pleasure. So... I wanted to talk to you about how you you were very much early involved with the internet right from the get go, and and I I really got into computers myself because I love the analogy that Steve Jobs fam famously um, came up with that there is no more efficient um, animal in nature compared to a human on a bicycle and he compared computers as bicycles for your mind yeah. that it could stretch the capabilities of humans and that the connectivity that we could experience and the great benefits of of computers was clearly apparent but what's happened with social media is that some people might argue that the programs have made slaves out of us yeah. The, that we become addicted to this idea that we have a digital identity and we need to protect it and preserve it. And it's made us slaves to the computers rather than vice versa. Would you, would you see it to that extent? I, I wouldn't say it's universal, uh, but it certainly can have that effect. Um, they're, they're writing social media software to encourage the dopamine response and unless people are aware of how they're being targeted um, it's extremely addictive um, it's extremely addictive to just want to know how you're ranking and if, if somebody likes something that you post you get that dopamine response and you want to do it again and again and again um, it's recognition, and, and uh, most humans react extremely positively to uh, praise and recognition. Yeah, and, and just by the nature that they've, they've changed Facebook in the last few years from being not just so much a platform, but they are, they are increasingly understanding the internal mechanisms in our brain which is going to keep us on the platform as long as possible and keep us engaged and then keep us continually checking in on it. What are some of the negative impacts that you see of, of that, those practices? 
Um, there's uh, the FOMO, the, the fear of missing out, that um, can have a depressive effect on people when they see their friends at a party that they weren't invited to, is the classic example. Um, but also just that their friends, the, the, what most people post on Facebook and social media are the sheen of their lives that shows their travel and the good times and has none of the hard depressive times that they've been through, the hard work that they've, they've had to put in to get there or the sickness and the illness. Um, most of it is the sheen and other people look at it and think, oh, well, their life is so much better than mine. Why does my life suck so hard? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that can be a very um, depressive element in people's lives that that s- sends them spiraling down. And it seems like it like it's the so-called friendship we have online is based less on true meaningful friendship that you have with a you know a, a you have a. a a, a traditional friendship is you talk to somebody face to face and you get to know contact. them and you really, you know, human contact. make yourself vulnerable to that person so they could provide insight into your life and you right. can do the same. And it seems like the online model of friendship is just all about kind of status that I'm doing something cool. You should like it or you do something cool and I'll like it. And this, it taps into the whole reciprocity elements of our brain where it, really seems to cheapen what friendship really is it's it's extremely superficial um uh, you know i've i talked to somebody i know who has literally thousands of facebook friends and and they were bemoaning the fact that they don't have any real friends um and you know i used to have this thing where where facebook would show me whose birthday was up on my calendar and I didn't know who that person was or how I got befriended with them online. So, uh, yeah, it's extremely superficial and, uh, completely lacking in human contact. And, and, um, there are, uh, theories out there now that, uh, this is why we've had a spike in anxiety and depression, why we've had a spike in, in suicide is that, um, these deep human relationships are, are lacking from our lives while we see the superficial uh, social media friendships glossing everything over. Yeah, and it's, it's something that I think um, maybe you and I have kind of seen because we, we experienced what the world was like before email was popular before facebook was popular yeah. we knew how oh, maybe you do, you wrote letters to people back in the day sure and you know what it's like to actually um put use, your use a map when you're driving yeah <laughs> <laughs> i man i can't do that anymore either. No, I that's too that difficult. Really hard. <laughs> but it's but it's like we have a little bit of advantage because like Gen Xers, we kind of see what it was like before. But if you're a, if you're a young millennial and all you've really known is this internet and you've known, all you know is friendship is a big chunk of it is what you're going through online. Do you feel like we're getting away from, from what it means to be human, even what it means to, to, to live in the world as an authentic human being and understand what human relations are all about? I think I think social media has driven us away from from that, but we haven't seen the backlash yet. Um, we haven't seen people standing up and saying, "Stop using this uh, in such a dramatic way that most of the population takes notice. it's uh, It's still a lot of people think, well, what's the harm? What's you know, I just use it here and there. And I think the majority of the population does do that, but that, what we should be concerned is is the percentage of the population that is addicted to social media and is um, having depressive negative effects from it. And why do you think it's just not really covered in the mainstream media that that this is having such a massive impact on on human relations on, and on well being? Um, well. Look at look at what happened with the election and, and the negative effect that social media had on that. I think that was pretty well covered. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just the surface of the problem, in, in my opinion, that uh, 
the the propagation of uh, fake news to influence an election um, that outrages most people. Um, uh, a teenager uh, sinking into depression because of what is happening on social media with their friends, that's not front page news. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe the, the suicide rate in Utah and, and other Western states, um, which I understand has spiked as well, uh, is what we should be looking at and which should be front page news. But um, I, I don't know what the solution is because in, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, I've, I've got uh, a, a couple teenagers in the house and they're not interested in Facebook. Really? Um, they're, they're using Snap to a large extent um, and Instagram. Um, but Facebook is passe in their minds. And so mm-hmm. maybe it's just that natural evolution. Um, but what I'm afraid is like the, <laughs> the cocaine is being refined into crack. Yeah. Um, that <laughs> Facebook was, was the cocaine and, and Snap and some of these other uh, TikTok and things like that are, are more intense uh, versions of the, the drug the, the dopamine drug that are being refined for our children. Well, I, I heard of a feature in Snap. I'm, I wasn't really familiar with it till I researched it recently. It's called, it's a feature called Streak. And if you've got somebody online who you consider a friend, then you gain a streak by messaging them every day. And it keeps track of that. And then it sort of creates this value online between you and this other person because you've streaked them you know maybe sent a message to them like 10 days in a row Mm -hmm. and then it's adding more credence to the idea that this digital virtual friendship has great meaning in your life and and i think it's like like you said it's like they took facebook and they refined the the idea of a friendship and they're trying to build on that making you believe that that has greater greater importance and and and, and I wouldn't I wouldn't discount you know the value of staying in touch with somebody and you know uh, messaging and even though um, like my brother is currently in Japan and and getting his messages and photos is impactful and, and knowing that he's doing all right yeah, um, yeah and that you know he still cares about me and um, there, there's certainly you know, I've always said that the the internet as a whole um, has so much benefit economically and socially and uh, like you said about the, in the the Steve Jobs analogy uh, with the bicycle that it, it's made us so much more powerful um, that there's there's always going to be uh, a drawback uh, a, a a percentage of that that is going to be prob- problematic mm-hmm. you go to any um, great city in the world and there's a certain amount of crime going on there's a certain amount of people getting hurt Mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of people being taken advantage of it's it's a human nature thing we haven't gotten to that utopian society online or offline Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good i mean it's a good thing to keep in mind for sure but i i i wonder like um if as a parent and you got kids who who love Snap, who love doing, you know, engaging with TikTok, maybe maybe making little videos, sharing them with friends. How do you navigate that world with your kid? Like, where do you draw the boundaries and how do you tell them about the potential pitfalls or even, would it be over-parenting to tell them you can't spend a lot of time or I don't want you on this platform or what do you... You you know, my kids have... um screen time limits that you know apple's implemented in their hardware um i think that's that's all always a judicious thing to try and do um but what i've also found with my son is that if if he runs out of screen time on his iphone he'll switch to his switch (laughs) his nintendo switch so it's just like jumping from one screen to another Mm -hmm. um but I think constant communication with them about, you know, I've talked to them about online predators and how you can't trust people online and you can't trust that they're actually your friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you should also try and be just as kind to people online as if they were in, in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's, uh, especially we, I think we both saw this when the internet was rising, there was this power of anonymity that people felt that they could say anything. Yeah. And, um, 
courtesy and uh, compassion kind of flew out the window for a lot of people because they felt, well, I've got this computer in front of me. I can say whatever I want. And that's still very true, but uh, it was something that we'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. It was something that, um, you know, the, in the early days of the Internet, we called it netiquette, um, that if you were uh, going to treat somebody poorly online, you would be shamed for it. Yeah. That's totally gone. Yeah, and I think it's been it's been allowed and um, exacerbated because on platforms like YouTube and I think Twitter, you can be completely anonymous and mm-hmm. go troll people and not feel like that's your real identity or feel like your real identity is going to experience any consequences at all to you going out and trolling somebody. And people do it for sport as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's you know I'm I'm a I'm a big believer in in the power of anonymity on the internet that uh, you know people who are whistleblowers and dissidents and um, sh- should have the ability to be anonymous to report on these things, mm-hmm. um, but there's a huge again drawback to uh, that that benefit. Yeah. Yeah, and I I recently. Um picked up this book it's called Z- zooked it's about mark zuckerberg and and this guy Ro- roger mcnamee um was an early uh advisor to mark mark zuckerberg when he was building facebook and the 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 major excellent component that facebook brought to the table that made it such a big success was that you weren't allowed to be anonymous on it on mm-hmm. the platform you actually needed to back your identity with an email address and a photo and it was all about you being who you are and connecting with your friends online but when you look at the way facebook was um used as the major tool in the cambridge analytica scandal Mm -hmm. where these uh just a little background on that story and you correct me if i'm wrong um Cambridge Analytica was essentially a firm that was able to get all of this data that Facebook had on users and understand exactly where the uh, the swing states voters resided and then use that to target ads that pushed them over. Yeah, that pushed them over the edge to to know that if we just get these particular people in these particular swing states to be motivated to not pro-Trump, but more anti-Hillary, right. that we could influence the election and in such a pr- precise way that's never been, been seen before. Yeah. And um, so how do we prevent that from continuing to happen? Because if they have that data out there and it's so incredibly valuable, valuable mm-hmm. enough to, we don't know for certain that that swung the election, but... but it, it, I think it certainly had an effect. Um, I, and, and how do you prevent it? I think there, are, for every time you put up uh, protections on the data, and, and Facebook claims that they've put up protections on this data now, um, there there are a dozen different people out there trying to take advantage of it and find ways around it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the point counterpoint that we constantly have in uh, computer security, where we find and we patch the problems, and then people, you know, there's actually people out there trying to find these problems uh, so we can patch them, but there's also people trying to find these problems so they can take advantage of them. And it's just, it's a con- a constant back and forth in, in, in the state that will never get to a stage where we've got perfect security. Um, I've told people that if they want perfect security on the internet, get off the internet because you'll never have it. And mm-hmm. so what people have to evaluate is whether... Um, giving all this information to Google and Facebook and the big tech tech companies about what they're doing and what their interests are is worth the cost. And people think, well, it's free. Um, the, the, there's a saying in Silicon Valley is that when something's free, um, when a product is free, you are the product. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I use Facebook exclusively as a broadcast medium. I just send out stories about my company x mission if i'm uh quoted or on a podcast i'll send that story out but i don't consume it anymore Mm -hmm. um i do consume twitter and Mm -hmm. um i don't 
don't know how good that is for me either um, because uh, it's, it's you know, there's a lot of good jokes on Twitter, but there's a lot of depressing things too. And um, I could be having an entirely good day until I jump on Twitter and see what's going on. Yeah. Um, but it's enormous. I mean, it's just so amazingly powerful that you can get on Twitter and follow, you know, 50 people and really find out what's going on in the world is important. And, and to have that ability at your fingertips at any time. Yeah, I, you know, I follow a, a, a bunch of people who aren't widely recognized in the press who do all their own research and, and have written books about this administration and have um, pointed out things, facts um, that they have uncovered um, that I haven't seen covered in the media at all. Um, so, you know, that's a, you know, again, a, an ampli- a great amplifier uh, that makes me more aware of what's going on in the world um, than most people reading a newspaper or, or a front page website. Um, but, you know, it, it has the pot- potential for abuse as well. And I don't think you're going to get away from that. Yeah. And I, and I guess my question is related to the growing power of these platforms and, and how much they do track what we do. And they really like the way he described it is they create a digital avatar of a, every user and your digital avatar, they know how politically inclined you are to agree with different kinds of opinions. Mm-hmm. So they know if you are a, a strong right wing, um, you know, white supremacist, neocon or whatever, or they know if you're a libertarian or they know if you're a Democrat or, how, or where you fall in the whole Political spectrum. spectrum. And, and, it's so, and just like you said, it's a free platform, but we are, we are the product. Right. And we are the product ripe for advertisement and influence by an ad that they know appeals to that most, that those innermost political leanings. And yeah, and, and, and Twitter does a pretty good job of, of targeting those ads for me. And, I, ironically, when I don't like an ad, I will tell Twitter I don't like an ad. So I, they're they're refining that targeting even more. And the more targeted you can make uh, your advertising, the more valuable it is to the people you're selling it to. Yeah, and they don't want to show you. That, so with these this digital avatar concept, they're not going to show you the the opinions that might challenge your own. They're going to show you opinions that you agree with. Right. And so, and by doing so, we create around ourselves what he calls filter bubbles. Right. And then we become just a perfect product for the propaganda that we agree with the most. And then we're, digi- we're, we're digitally nudged around to agree with certain concepts and, and not go anywhere near the ones that might challenge our opinions. Do you see it affecting the civil discourse negatively in that way? Yeah, and it has been for longer than Facebook and Twitter were popular. Um, it's uh, isolating people's opinions, and it's um, causing them not to question what they read. And, uh, it, you know, again, that dopamine response is like, well, you know, this it all is right in the world, and, and I, I'm right about my opinions, and um, n- there's nothing challenging out there to me to really try and dive into I don't I don't have the time or or inclination to be challenged Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are becoming more and more fractured as a as a political society where um, the the left thinks the right is ignorant and stupid and the right thinks the left is uh, evil and and uh, greedy yeah and you and you turn on the two I mean you turn on CNN and the entire universe is terrible under Trump. We live in an awful country. You know, everything Trump is doing is borderline evil. Mm-hmm. And then you turn on Fox News, and everything Trump's trying to do to make America great again is being destroyed and ruined by the left. And it's, it's like we live in two different universes. We all just want to listen to our own opinions yeah. So how does that? How do our ideas ever coalesce again? How do we ever become one country I, and one I people? Don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I 
the first time I ran for office, and this was 2006, before a lot of these things came to the fore. I, you know, I was I was a big del- believer in digital democracy back then, and I've become very cynical about it, unfortunately. Um, but I I used to talk about how so many uh, of what I view as the great countries in the world, like Japan and and Germany, um, had to go through a lot of um, pain to get to that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I don't endorse uh, that kind of pain, you know, being literally Japan and Germany were, were bombed into rubble, mm-hmm. and their ideologies of the uh, the the deification of the emperor or the the purity of the Aryan race were destroyed, and it was a good thing those things were destroyed, mm-hmm. um, but. The societies that rose out of uh, that rubble, I think, are more, more humane, um, more compassionate, um, more humble, and that hasn't happened to the United States yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you could argue the Civil War to some extent was was our reckoning, but not a modern reckoning by any any sense. And um, I don't. <laughs> it, the internet, you know, I'm a big, I'm still a big fan of the internet, and I, I believe in in the power of it, but I don't see how it can be reversed. I I, I believed in 2006 that uh, di- digital democracy would enlighten the conversation rather than destroy it, mm-hmm. and that's what exactly is what's happening right now. The conversation is being destroyed. We're not conversing with each other, and um, breaking through those filter bubbles is extremely difficult and but i i do believe that the human connection can can break through those filter bubbles. yeah i mean i i gotta say i think the only light at the end of the tunnel right now is podcasts yeah maybe <laughs> I, I i think that when to when two people can can connect on an issue mm-hmm. who maybe have differing points of view and that's and the discourse is is good and it's not fox news or cnn where they're just on to attack each other and then they're just waiting for their to get in that you know two sentence prepared statement on a panel of 10 people where it's all about it just attack 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 yeah. the podcast format i i kind of see that as being the one saving grace right now that's going on digitally i i, I just because you're right i just don't see i don't see forums where people on the left and people on the right are getting together and exchanging ideas and opinions and I, I think you're you're right and also you look at you you can go you can go and search any position and find some justification for that position mm-hmm. yeah. um, online whether it's um, backed by fact or not you can find a justification yeah. and just passing those links back and forth is not a dialogue it's not a human dialogue like we're, what we're having here mm-hmm. um, so m- maybe that's right. It's it's going back to trying to find more of those human connections, and you know, I would, I I I now that you mention it, I think I'm going to go look for a, a left and right podcast um, to listen to. I remember Left, Right, and Center on NPR. I don't know if that's still around. Oh yeah. But uh, just having people sit in a studio and and talk these issues through um, is very enlightening in itself, and it's and it's a good way to build a bridge. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll take a little break, and when we get back, um, we're going to talk more about um, what the fallout has become, not only from Cambridge Analytica, but from the uh, the Russian like they call them bots, but they were sort of digital avatars created to perhaps influence the election and, mm-hmm. and the fallout that happened with that, and and how we can prevent ourselves from becoming victims of of the social media platforms. <laughs> So, back in a minute. All right, for being such a great listener or watcher of the Utah Stories program, I want to make you a special offer. We are actually now finally launching our Made in Utah Utah Stories memberships. And for a limited time, we are offering our VIP memberships half off. So, what is a VIP membership? So, You might be aware we put on these amazing festivals that sell out all the time. We just had a Brewers Fest with 1,500 people where we had to turn away 500 people at the door. 
We don't want to have that happen. Instead, we want to ensure everybody can get in and everybody who is a member of the Utah Stories Made in Utah membership program will get VIP access. So for a limited time, we're offering memberships for just $100. This will get you a VIP pass to our next Made in Utah Festival, August 24th and 25th at the Gateway. Um, with this pass, you can sample food from all sorts of downtown restaurants, get cocktails from local distilleries. It is an awesome event, and this is a great offer because with this, you will be supporting this show, supporting the festivals, and supporting Utah's local economy. And you'll also get this T-shirt I'm wearing. This is our Made in Utah T-shirt made from the best fa fabric in the world. You can show your support of Utah's local economy by becoming a member and putting this T-shirt on. So visit utahstories.com, click Become a Member, and you can sign up right now. Okay, we're back. So um, off the air, we were just talking about how um, two of the people in our office here, they're really disengaged from social media, and they, they don't really use it very often. But... Um, I thought it was interesting, Drew, Drew saying that he likes the overlord of Facebook to tell him, to show him what's funny, what he's going to like, what's gonna, what he's going to find appealing. The algorithm. Yeah, via the algorithm, like be, being super TV powerful. Yeah. yeah, it's like the perfect TV. They already know what you want. And it's like that's the beauty of, of Netflix as well. It's like it's incredible how I'll get on Netflix and it'll show me three picks that – based on what I like, and I don't even know how they know what I, I guess just based on what I previously enjoyed. Watch, yeah. yeah, they they can recommend these movies that they know I'm going to enjoy. And, and then YouTube's just doing the same thing now. Oh, Spotify, I jumped on Spotify at the end of 2017, and I've listened to more music that I never would have discovered without Spotify's algorithm Yeah. Um, than my entire life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a, there's these great benefits in kind of handing over your preferences to Amazon and Netflix and Spotify because they'll serve up stuff that you might be interested in. Yeah, and then, the, and then obviously the question becomes when or do we ever start to just give up our own sovereignty and just trust that they'll always know what we want, what we like, that the products that they – we don't even quite understand yet that we should have, they know that we want them and that we should have them. I mean, how much of our sovereignty should we be given up to, to, to become the, to a full on consumer? Yeah. Um, or I, is, I, is there a danger in that? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, you're, you're asking what it is to be human versus just a, a, conduit through which products flow uh, we, we go to work and we earn money so we can buy products um i i don't think that that level of targeting is destroying our compassion to be human uh yet mm -hmm. um or it's destroying our ability to connect with other humans yet um but it certainly has that that potential i mean i think that uh going back to social media versus um, music and, and movies and television and uh, hard products that you would buy on Amazon, going back to social media, that that is destroying our ability to connect. It's destroying a lot of people's ability to connect. And, and yet there are people who would never, who are, who are so introverted and shy that they would not make those connections otherwise um, without those tools. Mm -hmm. Um so there, I think there is a, a lot of hand wringing about the direction we're going, but um, we we're, we continue uh, to highlight the the drawbacks without realizing the benefits. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it's like I I tend to be quite a critic of it because of of just how I I guess I've personally seen the the platform cause me to lose some some real connections with friends and instead I, I think we we rely on Facebook to kind of know what each other are doing and then then we're not in contact as much as we were and 
and I and I don't see much positive in that. But I mean, what can we what can we point out as being the um, the greatest benefits? I mean, I, I got to say I liked I liked LinkedIn because you don't have uh, you know why you're there. Mm-hmm. You're you're there because you're looking at companies, you're looking at leaders, you're finding out what your friends are doing professionally. It's not it's not attached to this uh, it's not political. But what are what do you think are the greatest benefits of, of social media the way it is and, and what how can we use it in the best possible form and function? Well I I don't get any sort of um information off of Facebook anymore in regards to my family and friends. I don't, I don't use it for that anymore. So it's hard for me to see a, much of a benefit in Facebook. I, I know that when I post something to Facebook, it's, it does have a reach, um, and I will get information through other channels um, about people reading it. Um, so I think there remains a benefit in staying connected to what people are doing um, it, it remains a benefit in um, broadcasting new stories rather than trying to rehash um, old or make up stories. Um, I, I, you know, I, an informed public informed public is uh, vital to democracy, as as Thomas Jefferson said. Um, the problem we're having is um, separating the wheat from the chaff, as far as uh, facts and um, lies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that I, I like to believe that Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Jack Dorsey um, realize the negative impact that their platforms are having on society and want to make a change there, even though uh, it may uh, impact their bottom line. Um, they're affected by it as well. You know, mm-hmm. even if you've got a billion dollars in this country, if if uh, the populace is revolting and unhappy, you're you're going to end up in the guillotine. And now it's 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 not a good thing to have a lot of money and be on top of everything when ninety nine percent of society is unhappy. Yeah, you know? that's a good point. I've I've heard um, things are are getting so bad in the Bay Area right now, <laughs> as far as housing costs that. Um, you can't find blue collar workers to to do jobs there. You can't find the chefs are moving out of the city because they can't afford to live there. Um, so having a balanced society, um, I think that they would have an interest in doing that rather than just rape and pillaging. Um, so, you know, they've made motions in those directions, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, and, and maybe they need to be replaced by something we haven't even imagined yet that is able to highlight facts over lies. Mm-hmm. Do you, so you, you think that you think there is a method, there is a way in which Zuckerberg can take his, I can't, I can't even remember, is it, is it a $80 billion company <laughs> and somehow say to Mega sh- billion. Yeah, the shareholders, Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna now take a take a step step back and try to do what's right, which is reverse some of these psychological inputs that we know get people addicted, and take an approach where an even-handed approach where we're not allowing you to just sit in your filter bubble and listen to all the opinions you agree with, which would affect profits and and. You, you 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 think that could that could actually happen? I, I'm skeptical that it will happen, um, but if I, I hope that if Zuckerberg doesn't take that hand and and try and steer uh, the ship in that direction, that somebody else will replace him. That some other platform will come up that will be better. I mean, in a lot of ways, P- Facebook is a terrible platform. It's got a terrible user user interface. It's not intuitive. It's it's difficult to. Um, dial back your privacy controls it's difficult to find anything Mm -hmm. um and i've i've seen people complain about it over and over again but the 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 thing that facebook and you know i use ebay a lot and ebay also has a terrible user interface um that they have is mass 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You and dislodging that mass um, with a startup is extremely difficult, but I think it could be done with a better interface. Um, and you know, I, speaking as a, a small tech company, um, you know, standing up for uh, individual privacy is not a hard thing to do. Um, it's not always the most profitable thing to do. I could have made a lot of more money off of watching what my subscribers are doing online, um, but I don't want to. Um, mm-hmm. And I think in some ways Apple has made that choice. I yeah. mean, they make their money off of hardware. They make a lot of money off of their hardware. There's a huge profit margin there. And that allows them to say, okay, we're going to protect privacy in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, what I what I liked is that I read out of the four big tech companies, um, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Apple, though the other tech companies are tracking your every move online. They they have that pixel element, which I don't I, I don't I didn't was not aware of that that they know exactly what you're doing on every single site you go to mm-hmm. on Google. And then Google has heavily implemented the Maps feature in your phone to know where you're going and to know what your daily routine looks like. And they use that data to help advertisers make the best selection to um, advertise to you. And But Apple... I didn't know this. They implemented their own Maps feature because they did not like that Google was tracking the iPhone users at all times, which was a huge expense. And you know, I know that the f- the first iteration of Apple Maps um, didn't work so well, and their product manager got fired over it. Um, but the fact that they would make that decision um, indicates to me at a loss, really. I mean, they they kind of paved loss. the way to show how. As a tech company, you can do what's best for your users and not always what's best for the, for your investors. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that that eventually turns around and and you know Apple has been hammering privacy uh, in advertising as as the benefit in using Apple. Um, I uh, I also tend to think that that with um, a gay uh, CEO in charge, Tim Cook, that he kind of recognizes the value of privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a there's a, a cascading effect throughout the company where they they look at ways. I mean, they, they've not only put policies in place to protect individual privacy, they put hardware into place. The, the um, engineering of the iPhone is structured so that if you don't have the password or you don't have the the thumb code or the face scan you can't get into that iPhone even if you have the hardware opened up and um, there are companies you know the the FBI hates that Mm -hmm. but Apple has continually pushed back on a privacy standpoint to protect that that even Apple can't even get into it um, if uh, if uh, they need to extract some data out of the phone without the subscriber's permission. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, they have this, they have a a special part of their processor called the security enclave, where, as as I understand it from a tech perspective, things go in, but they can't come out unless the key is given from the the, uh, user of the phone. Wow. Now, you know, of course, law enforcement could hold up the phone to your face if you have the, the face ID, or they could force you to put your, your thumb on it uh, if, they're, if you're unconscious or whatever and unlock it that way. But uh, it's been constitutionally upheld that if you have your phone locked with a passcode that they can't demand that out of you because it's uh, causing you to incriminate yourself under the Fifth Amendment. Mm-hmm. And so I guess what I, I don't understand is... Because when our founders drafted the Constitution and they were looking at, you know, protection of personal property and protection of rights and and freedom, obviously they couldn't understand or foresee that there would be a day where these mechanisms inside of your phone could track your every move and what you're doing at every moment. How or or what's it going to take for people to wake up and understand that this your data and your privacy is totally being exploited to control and manipulate you. 
what is it going to take for people to understand that we we need to actually disengage from those those policies that just give them free reign? Will it would it take the government to act on that? And well, it has in the European Union. Um, I don't think on an individual pace, uh, basis uh, the majority of the population is going to wake up to the fact that they are being tracked and their habits are being recorded um, unless something bad happens as a result. Um, mm-hmm. Most people are not even aware that it's happening. And we, we go back to that, you know, whether people um, agree with it or not, they're not aware that it's happening. And building that awareness in people is extremely difficult. Um, and so in, in the European Union, they have taken approaches to protect individual privacy. They've gone after uh, Google and Facebook, and, and I think Google got signed, fined several billion dollars for violations of privacy. Um, they have these rules, uh, the uh, I think it's the GPDR, where you go to a website and they have to inform you of their use of uh, tracking technology if they're using it. Um, so the European Union has taken a much more aggressive stance on protecting individual privacy. I would love to see the United States do that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the Constitution is... Uh, what protects our privacy from government, not necessarily what protects our privacy from corporations. And I think that that's where a lot of people get muddled is they, if they get kicked off of Twitter, they're saying this is against the First Amendment. Well, Twitter's a private platform, just like a private bar, and you can get kicked out for being a jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has nothing to do with the First Amendment. Um, but then Twitter is able to decide who are the jerks and who aren't the jerks yeah, based they are. on their <laughs> they political are. ideas. And, and, you know, there's been competing platforms that have, that have propped up for that will take any sort of hate speech. They'll take any sort of um, uh, white supremacy uh, speech. Uh, they'll take it. They'll, they'll take all takers, but they're not as popular as Twitter. And yeah. Probably do never do you be. agree with those, the moves that, Facebook and, and, and uh, Twitter have taken in, in deplatforming people who they don't deem as, uh, I guess, in promotion of hate speech. They, they decided that Alex Jones and, and, um, and f- first him, and now it's people who are not so far right, have been deplatformed. Do you think that that's, that's fair or that's a good move for them to take? Uh, I, I wrote early on in this discussion, I wrote a blog entry about how um, – I'm, I'm a big believer in free speech, and uh, X Mission has long supported um, political ideologies across the spectrum. Um, but I'm not going to give a megaphone to somebody to shout fire in a crowded theater. Mm-hmm. Um, and my platform is a megaphone. Um, and if you're speaking, uh, y- if you are talking about hurting people or you're in, in inciting people to hurt people yeah i'm not going to support that um i think twitter especially jack dorsey has had a real hard time drawing that line mm-hmm. um although and i totally agree with you you can't you, sh- you can't call you can't crowd fire in a crowded theater but if there's some wackos who who are not inciting violence but they are inciting I guess you'd you, I guess you'd call it hateful rhetoric. Um, to just simply deplatform those people gives their followers more fodder that their conspiracies are, are true. Yeah. That the big powers that be don't want these conspiracies to get out. And and if somebody's a racist, I'd rather know they're a racist than have them working in the underground on, you know black internet uh or dark web dark web um you know channels to to subversively get their opinions out and that that will always be there i mean the dark web will always be there and and you know alex jones can get kicked off of facebook and twitter but he still can have a website i'm sure somebody some internet service provider is still going to provide him service or host his website i mean he could he could go offshore and host that website yeah and, and i think it just builds more it adds more fire to his flame that that his conspiracy theories and, and strange ideas could, could it adds validity to him if if he's being deplatformed, doesn't it? Maybe, um, but I don't think that he was any less powerful before he was deplatformed. 
I think that um, he he got to the level that he's at um, with advertisers and recognition by using these major platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and I think what what they're trying to evaluate is whether um, opening up their platform to everyone is worth the cost of raising these cranks to a national level um, where they're taking advantage of people. Yeah. Uh, you know, summarily, I think Alex Jones is a grifter. He mm -hmm. is selling uh, snake oil on his website, then, and that's how they make their money. And um, the more attention they can get, um, whether it's uh, – calling Sandy Hook a fake or, or coming up with conspiracy theories about uh, the, the opposite uh, side of the political spectrum. Um, they're trying to drum up and gin up uh, attention mm -hmm. so they can sell their wares. It's the worst kind of clickbait. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not trying to contribute to the civil discourse. If he, if he did, he wouldn't have a shop on InfoWars where you can buy all this junk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean, I, I agree that, that, that he doesn't contribute to the civil discourse, and I agree that, that uh, what he does is not helpful, but it seems like there's always a segment of the population that's going to gravitate towards that, that element. And if it's harder for them to get to, and it's not able to be on a, on a major so-called platform, well, first of all, I don't think you can call those platforms anymore, because... If they're not open to to hosting a variety of ideas, as long as they're not specifically saying "let's go out and kill these specific people," then I I just see that going down a rabbit hole that could go very wrong. Well, one thing we sh we should look at is, uh, for example, the QAnon cons conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. The the Q does not use Twitter or Facebook. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with that. What uh, is it? QAnon? Yeah. Oh, that's way deep in the rabbit hole. I mean, these are people who think that uh, the Democrats are are uh, in charge of a pedophile ring. That you remember Comet Ping Pong, the pizza. They 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 said that there was uh, they called it Pizza Gate, and they said there was oh, a, yeah. a basement filled yeah. with with children in there that they were using yeah. for pedophilia. And some guy went in and shot up the place. Wow. Now, QAnon is not on any major platform. But it's still being spread around, and and the fact that it's not on any major platform, the fact that you need to hunt it out, and to get the real knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, makes it even more of a conspiracy. Uh -huh. um, but they are ask they are inciting violence. Telling are they telling people to go shoot up? No, um, I haven't I haven't seen the the people behind it inciting violence. What they say is like, this is what's happening, and people go nuts. People go nuts, and they think. I've got to take a stand against these pedophiles in the government, and I'm going to go out and, I mean, there was another guy that got on Hoover Dam, I think, with a bomb and was going to blow up the, the dam Jeez. Um, because the government wasn't listening to this conspiracy theory um, and that, you know, everything was, was massed against these people. Hmm. Um, the, the world is, is filled with these evil reptilian overlords and oh, um, I did hear only, about that. Yeah, only Q, <laughs> only Q knows the truth, and and people are subscribing to it, even though it's not on a major platform. And you know, I know Alex Jones has had some part in pushing this around too. But um, yeah, I, you know, going back to Twitter and um, Facebook, I think um, their their stands against hate speech and dangerous speech are our efforts to try and clean things up and show that they want to be a beneficial member of society. Yeah, and, and that's all really happened in response to what they found out happened with the influencing of the election by the Russian, they call them bots, but they were, they were really Russian trolls right. who were acting, they were basically sock puppets, where a group of people in Russia decided they were going to create their own, a bunch of digital identities on Facebook and they would join these groups or start private groups and they would they would recruit members to the groups and then they would try to push ideas um, 
and and I, it sounded like from what I heard with the um, interview I heard with the woman who studied the the uh, the whole uh, program. I, I can't remember her name, but what it was was they they would target groups like African Americans who could possibly be convinced that Hillary Hillary Clinton was the wrong person to vote for, mm-hmm. and then they would they would go on and and slowly chip away at ideas that she didn't like black people and that this done in in many many groups with many different identities could have had an influence on the election so this is so this really is happening the deplatforming is all in response to the possibility that these russian sock puppets influence the election is that correct well, the other thing, I it, Samantha B did a couple stories about the Russian trolls, and um, there was one one aspect of it. I think it was just important to point out is that uh, these Russian trolls, there were literally houses of people, uh, buildings of people, posting this stuff on Facebook and posting this stuff on Twitter and posting this stuff on other social media, um, not in an effort to influence the election, but in an effort to make money. They were posting mm-hmm. clickbait. So you would click on it on Facebook and go to the website, and you'd see a whole bunch of advertisements along with the clickbait. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were stories about puppies just as much as there were stories about Hillary Clinton. The, the question comes in is, is where did uh, the Trump campaign communicate with uh, Vladimir Putin and, and Vladimir Putin's intelligence service utilize these trolls to influence the election. So there's that aspect that is there too, mm-hmm. but overall the trolls were just posting clickbait trying to get people to click on it and having some ads on the website. Yeah, the sucker's money. born every minute and the the more salacious and crazy the clickbait was, the more likely the people would click on it. Yeah. Um and and that's the majority of what the the Russian trolls were putting forward. And I don't know if Facebook has has done any effort to shut that kind of thing down. Again, it's it's. Uh, well, I heard they deleted the the accounts of several million users that they they deemed were not legitimate. Oh, and and Twitter did as well. I mean, they trimmed off a lot of bots. And, and I think that's great. That yeah. makes a lot of sense because you you base your, the integrity of these platforms is based on the idea, at least that every user on Facebook is a real person. Yeah. And if they find that that's not true, of course they should just go ahead and delete their account. Yeah. And, uh, uh, identity on the internet is a, is a really, um, difficult problem that people have been trying to solve for years. How do you verify that somebody isn't actually who they are? Um, and not a, um, a bot or a a troll or a a sock puppet. Mm -hmm. Um, and they'll, you know, I'm sure Facebook again wants to keep up the integrity of the platform um, and not have it devolve into uh, a mass of trolls talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I just, I don't see, I, I personally don't see it being a good move to deplatform of people who, who they, they deem are conspiracy theorists. I definitely agree that if they're instigating hatred, Al Qaeda shouldn't be on Facebook. Sure. That that's a good idea, but but I I, I know you've I want to switch gears and go into something I know you've been a strong um, you've been strongly outspoken about, and that's the idea of net neutrality. Yeah, and I I'm not well uh, I haven't researched net neutrality to the extent that I should, but how would you describe it in a nutshell? Uh, net neutrality is the idea that a an internet service provider or somebody providing transport on the internet cannot discriminate uh, internet traffic for financial reasons. So I discriminate traffic on X Mission all the time. We block spammers, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, we, d- we block people uh, with firewalls from getting into our systems uh, to protect our subscribers. Um, but if I said, okay, um, n- uh, Google, I want you to pay me more money in order to use my network, um, that would be uh, discriminating traffic. Or if I told my subscribers, in order to get to Netflix, I'm going to charge you another $5 mm-hmm. a month on top of what Netflix is, is charging you. That would be discriminating traffic. Or if I was 
Xfinity Comcast and I wanted to push my TV product over Netflix or Hulu or HBO now, um, I could lower the priority of the traffic of all those other streaming providers and make it impossible for people to get to so they can only buy my service. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been some few real examples uh, in the past 15 years where, uh, for example, an internet service provider didn't want um, their um, telephony service uh, to be com- uh, competed against by um, some of the national uh, telephony services over the internet. I can't remember the, the names of some of them. but What's telephony? Uh, phone calls over the internet, essentially. Oh, okay. Um, so they were selling a telephone service um, to their subscribers, and they deprioritized the the telephone services coming in from the outside. Oh, okay. And the FCC slapped them for that. Um, so net neutrality, before the FCC uh, essentially eliminated uh, what they call uh, Title II, I believe, um, which dictated that Internet service providers could not make these kind of discriminatory choices. Um, uh, it was, it was uh, the FCC would step in and make these decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, now, so basically, in an, you you as as Amazon can't create more bandwidth through an internet service provider directly to your site, so that your site is able to feed data music movies way faster than a smaller competitor is that right well amazon um if they approached x mission and said we want to prioritize the traffic and we're going to give you a, a, a an extra amount of money to do it um i could make that choice now now i've i've pledged to not discriminate traffic make um you know the small websites just as important as amazon mm-hmm. um but you could say I could do that. Under, okay, under Amazon, current. give me a bunch of money, and I'll give you more yeah. bandwidth on my network. I could do that, um, and the whole I whole outrage over what the FCC did in eliminating those protections is that we're going to see a segmented internet where the big companies have priority access to the customers, and the small startups can't get started. Mm-hmm. Um, now. I believe that's important to have in place up to a point, and that point is robust competition. So in most markets in the in the country, you have the choice of one, possibly two, internet service providers. Um, in uh, the uh, we we service a fiber optic network in Utah called Utopia. Utopia, mm-hmm. and on Utopia, um, there's about ten different service providers. Now, if I made those choices where I said, okay, I'm going to deprioritize Google unless they pay me more money, which I think would be shooting myself in the foot anyway, Mm -hmm. um, my subscribers would notice. And they'd say, why are you doing this? And I'd say, well, I want more money from Google. And they'd say, well, screw you. We're going to jump to another provider. And on Utopia, you could do that in a day. Hmm. You don't have to pay anybody else to run wires to your house because you've got this enormous fiber optic cable that is – run by um, an independent governmental agency, uh, Utopia, um, that can carry literally thousands of internet service providers on it. Mm -hmm. Um, So jumping from one internet service provider to another is an easy thing to do. So I want to provide the best possible service I can. I'm motivated Mm -hmm. to compete. Yeah. Um, Entities like Comcast and CenturyLink in Utah are not always motivated to compete because they have captive customers they can raise the price at at will um they can uh do these net neutrality violations they can provide crappy service they don't have to answer the phone um and as a result the captive customers have no choice and the fcc has abandoned the protection of those captive customers as well because this title two went away yeah so so net neutrality is a pretty much a misnomer it's not about neutrality it's about allowing big internet companies to create a freeway off-ramp right well net 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 neutrality is the opposite of it net neutrality is what we should have internet service providers neutral Uh from the traffic they carry yeah um so the fcc got rid of that 
and now it's uh, the Wild West. Now, you know, idiots like Mike Lee said, well, we didn't have net neutrality when the Internet started. Mm -hmm. Um, Why do we need it now? Um, And the thing is, is the technology to discriminate traffic was not invented um, back in the start of the Internet. And when I started X Mission in 1993, we were just more concerned about getting data from point A to point B rather than tearing apart that data and deciding which could go faster and slower. Mm-hmm. Um, that technology only came about in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. And that's when new- net neutrality became more and more important. I mean, when I was running in 2006, people were talking about net neutrality. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm a big advocate for um, municipal fiber optic networks. I think it's just the same as uh, municipal roads or municipal airports. It's an infrastructure upon which providers can compete. Yeah. Um, we so have, it, you, you like the idea of it being owned by the municipality as opposed to owned by Google Fiber or a third party who can be completely manipulated by corporations and it's in yeah terms it's too the, tempting the for data. them to uh, prioritize their own service um, Google fiber when they started said that they were going to open it up to other providers and then um, as I understand it a, a cable company exec came in to operate Google fiber and he said no we're not going to do that we're going to keep this for ourselves hmm. um, as a result uh, I think Google fiber has not made as much money as it could and it's been dialed back in a number of cities um, it's been very slow to roll out in Salt Lake City um, I don't know anybody personally that has it um, yeah I, I have that headquarters at trolley square yeah I ask him the same question every time I go in when is it going to be available at my house I'm like a mile and a half from your headquarter and they always say, oh, probably six months down the road. Yeah, who knows? Um, and I, it, it's, it's entirely possible they're going to eventually dial it back here. Google has a, a tendency to lose interest in their products. and uh, So what now? I don't quite understand. So why did that make it so they would earn less profit on it, potentially? Because th- I think the hardest part of doing Internet service is the support. Mm-hmm. You know, answering the phone and keeping the customers happy. And... Um, Putting in the infrastructure, if they had opened it up to X Mission or other providers, we would be doing the hardest part in keeping those customers connected and, and motivated to stay on it. Oh, by leasing that infrastructure out to you guys or right. somebody else. And it yeah. expands the sales force as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I think the, the customers who use Utopia are so adamantly, um, ferociously protective of it. They, they love the service and... Um, it's not until they get on it that they get they get so uh, pro utopia. I mean, there's a lot of in in Utah. There's a lot of you know government shouldn't be involved in this. It's not the role of government. Um, but once they get on it, they're immediate converts. And and utopia is in just Utah County, is or, when it's remember? in eleven Utah cities, and um, I can try and name them off: uh, Orem, Payson, um, West Valley City, Midvale, Murray. Centerville, uh, Tremont, and Brigham City. Hmm. And I'm sure I'm missing That's a lot somebody. of places. Yeah, um, but these were all cities that bonded together and said, "We're sick of the status quo. We're going to build this infrastructure." And as far as I've seen, it's unique in the United States. Uh, there have been other cities that have built fiber optic networks, but they've also provided the service on top of that. They haven't opened it up for third-party service providers. Yeah. Well, as I mean, I, I tend to lean very libertarian, but I mean, when you talk about infrastructure being owned by one mega corporation that owns also ninety five percent of all the search that's capability, tracking everything you do, <laughs> yeah, that's tracking everything. I mean, that's kind of kind of agree with you. That might be better if it's owned by a municipality. Uh, with Google Fiber owning uh, the service provider as well, they not only if you if you decide to go to DuckDuckGo, I don't know if you're familiar with that yeah, website. Mm-hmm. I use DuckDuckGo 90% of the time for my searches um, because they don't track. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you decide to go to that w- that website and search on there, Google can still see what websites you're going to after you get the search query back. If you're using Chrome. Or no, if even if well, you, yeah, if, if they're using not. Chrome, but if they're if they're the service provider, everything oh, you do. Oh, because they're the service provider. Yeah, you really? can see where you're going on the internet. Wow. 
So, so even I, if you're using Internet Explorer or Firefox and DuckDuckGo, Google's still going to track where you're going because they own the, the Internet service. Yeah. Uh, there's there's also a, Man. A, a DNS service that, that Google has. Um, if you point to their DNS server for uh, – I, sh- I should say what DNS is. It's when you put in a website name. Mm-hmm. It has to go to a DNS server to say, okay, what's the internet address for this website name, which is a bunch of numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, Google publicly put up a, a DNS server for anyone to use, but you can bet they are tracking every single thing that is being done on there. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of scary. And and tell me a little bit more about X Mission, what you guys provide, how you found your niche in this really competitive arena. Um, we... Uh, started in 1993 as a dial-up internet service provider. Um, today, uh, the core of our business is the Utopia network that I mentioned. That's the that's the only way we reach people in the home is on Utopia. Uh, we just recently decommissioned our our DSL network with uh, CenturyLink, so we don't do DSL anymore. Um, we <laughs> We have a handful of people actually still using dial-up, and there's like a point of pride that I haven't shut wow. that down completely. No yet. way. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but uh, the core of our business is Utopia, and we also have a data center in downtown Salt Lake City. Um, mm-hmm. We uh, do a lot of web hosting, um, mostly for Utah companies and Utah organizations. Um, we do a lot of email hosting for the same. And the... The niche that I feel like we've found is that we're a local company with local service, and the people who answer the phone are right next to our data center. They're not in some call center uh, in another part of the country or another part of the world. And our mission is to help people uh, when they call in rather than get them off the phone. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we take a very strong privacy stance in that we push back uh, against privacy intrusions, uh, we will only give out customer information uh, with a proper court-signed warrant for that information, and um, we have pushed back against law enforcement requests and uh, attorney requests for information that didn't meet those guidelines, mm-hmm. that didn't meet the, the standard of a warrant. Um, and as a result, I, I like to believe that um, law enforcement has gotten to the point where they they realize how important a warrant is. Um, in about 2007 or 8, uh, the Utah legislature had uh, the Attorney General's office put forward a bill at the Utah legislature that allowed for uh, law enforcement to request uh, information of an internet service provider um, with a what they call an administrative subpoena, which is not a warrant. It's just a piece of paper that somebody fills out. Mm-hmm. Um, traditionally, administrative subpoenas have been used for one department of government to get information from another department of government. And what the Attorney General's office has said, we're, we're going to extend this to internet service providers, even though they're not departments of government. Yeah. And the bill that first came out was in any sort of investigation, and they narrowed that down to child endangerment because think about the children, which is how a lot of terrible bills get passed through the legislature. Mm -hmm. And this got passed, and we pushed back against it. We got these administrative subpoenas, and we send them back with an attorney from our, with a letter from our attorney that said, send us a warrant. Mm -hmm. And in every single case, they did not send us a warrant. Wow. And um, I think we were the only only company that was pushing back against this. I don't know what was happening inside of uh, the other Internet service providers. Um, but four years after that bill was passed, I was contacted by um, a senator in, in the legislature, and, said, and he said, I, I want to fix this. Mm-hmm. And he went in and amended the bill, amended the law to say wherever it said administrative subpoena, he replaced it with warrant. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he fixed it, and as a result, you know, our pushing back against that fixed the law. That's great. And privacy for everyone. And that's, that's in just in Utah, or was that the federal that level? That was just in Utah. Okay. Um, we've had issues on the federal level. We've had 
warrants from outside of our jurisdiction that we've sent back. Um, you know, if, if somebody in, in New Mexico sends us a warrant and it's not in their jurisdiction, we tell them that and we send it back to them. Um, they need to be using the FBI for something like that. So you guys are getting requests for warrants quite often, I guess. Well, it is tapered. Um, yeah. In fact, we publish all the requests that we get. Um, if you go to xmission.com slash transparency, it mm -hmm. will show all the requests and how we responded to them. And there are warrants on there that we have responded with information. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate that you guys are out there because, I mean, Gmail is kind of the default standard these days. and But Gmail reserves the right to read all your email. And yeah, they claim <laughs> they don't, but I, you know, again, that's how they made that's how they make their money is building those demographics. Oh, yeah. and They know exactly um, how you're corresponding, and, and at any point in time they want to do a deep dive into who you are, who you're corresponding with, what's going on in your business. They can do that. And um, and so you, you'll you protect those all of those emails of all your customers yeah, completely. Absolutely. And, 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 and we, you know, there are times when we have to – ask permission of the customer to go into their email to diagnose a problem for technical reasons. There are times when we, uh, our spam filters will catch email and get forwarded, as, forwarded to us and we need to adjust those filters, again, for technical reasons. Um, I have had two cases, well, actually, yeah, it was two cases where people, technicians, read email of customers for personal reasons and they got fired on the spot. Wow, and everyone knows that that's that's the law there. That you know these were excellent technicians, but they they got involved in a personal relationship thing and they got fired because of it. Hmm. Um, so I'm I'm the the motto at X Mission is uh, it, we want X Mission to be the service that we would want to buy, that we would want to use, and so we kind of use that guidelining principle and and trying to figure out how to make decisions. And it seems like you guys are probably quite an anomaly because internet service providing, I mean, providing internet hosting seems like it's just kind of a race to the bottom. And Amazon cloud services have, have grown so massive and they're so ubiquitous all over. And it's, and I guess it's so cheap too. And I was, I, we were hosting with a company in Provo that used to be good and I guess they were caught up in that race to the bottom because their all of their customer support yeah. just went to crap. They were, they were. You'd call up and there'd be a person in India or China or wherever, and you couldn't get any help. And then we we switched to you guys, and and it's like you said, you 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 hear a person on the phone, you know they're in the same place where you live. Is are there other places like this across the country that have been able to come up and? Uh, you know, I know we have a partnership with a company in California called Sonic, um, that has taken similar stance that we do. Um, the, the internet service provider is an, is an endangered, independent internet service provider is, is definitely an endangered species. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I've I've compared my business too is the restaurant business I mean, you can go to a fast food place like mcdonald's or arby's and get food mm -hmm. or you can go to a good local restaurant and have an enjoyable meal and it was, it's going to cost you more mm -hmm. um that's where, what we've carved out and um i have no intention of uh diminishing that in the future at all yeah well that's cool i i i always like to uh find local anomalies where you're able to compete against the the big boys and and keep your business and your customers happy so that's yeah and i i don't know you know i don't have people coming to us and saying well amazon offers this and you offer this uh, why should i use you i'm like if you feel like amazon is a better choice for you use them mm -hmm. um i th i think that that service and support and the, the fact that we're not this big behemoth is a selling point in, in itself uh, uh, Amazon has had outages. I mean, it's, it's national news when Amazon has outages because all these services go down. Uh, and why somebody starting a dot-com would choose to use Amazon rather than manage their own servers, I, I, I can see the value in it as far as, like, it's very cheap to get started, but once you start getting traffic on there, it gets very expensive. I would much rather manage my own servers. Well, and it's such a target for, if I mean, if you're 
as the Chinese are getting way more sophisticated in hacking, and you've got one company controlling so many servers all over the country, isn't Amazon a massive, massive target for yeah. hackers? Yeah, well, I, I <clears throat> hate talking about this, but I think the Internet as a whole is very delicate. Um, I, I never talked about this until... Um, I can't remember what, I think it might, it might have been Esquire that did an article about how a few real, well-placed bombs could take down a majority of the internet and we would be so up a creek for so long mm -hmm. um, with everything that depends on it now. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that the awareness is building on that. You know, the, the whole idea that the internet was engineered by the Department of Defense to survive a nuclear war, I think, is a little bit silly. Um, but we need to be thinking about um, more redundancy and more paths of transit. And, and I think, you know, things like municipal fiber and state fiber is, is a big part of that. Yeah, more decentralization. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to the social media conversation. It's just. We, for everything we do on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, we give these platforms more control and power, but then they control so much of the conversation. Really, the only way to change that is to decentralize and try to do more locally and, and do more online locally. Yeah, It's a challenge. I, I don't know what the solution is at this point. but Well, I, I think there's a great opportunity for whoever can figure that out. Um, you know, if if Apple sold a little box that stored all your photos off of the cloud, I'd probably buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of companies that do sell those little boxes that organize your photo collections. And um, I think we're we're just starting to see the dawn of that decentralization. Uh, the whole the whole internet was decentralized, and then we coalesced in these these giant behemoths. And I think it's starting to go back to decentralization. At least I hope it is. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, cool. Thanks for being on, Pete. I You're really welcome. appreciate it. Enjoy Good conversation. It. Thank you for listening or watching the Utah Stories program. Again, my name is Rich Marcosian. I'm the editor and publisher of Utah Stories magazine. Found all over Utah, 27,000 copies every month. If you want to support this show, you can do so in one of three ways. First of all, if you're listening on iTunes, please give us a five-star review. This will enable more people on the platform to know we exist. Second of all, if you're watching on YouTube, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to the channel. And be sure to click on the bell icon so you're alerted when new videos show up. Third of all, you can become a member of Utah Stories and Made in Utah for just $9.99 per month or $99 for the entire year. And as a special introductory offer, we are giving you a $50 ticket to our Made in Utah Festival VIP section coming up in August. So August 23rd and 24th at the Gateway, we put on this massive festival with 200 vendors from all over Utah making products, uh, all of which uh, support the local economy. We'll put you in the VIP section if you become a member visit utahstories.com and click on the membership button to sign up for that. That would be awesome. So uh, next episode, we have on the program with us Dr. John Labrette to talk about health and wellness and gut health. We get into medical cannabis, but mostly we talk about overcoming cancer and the best ways to treat cancer. So be sure to tune in next time. This has been Rich Marcosian signing out. Thank you.